In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Well, hello, dear ones. I'm here at a hotel at the Parish Life Conference in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm with one of my favorite priests in the world, Father Peter Hears. And they're coming out with a new publication, uh, The Acts of the Eighth Ecumenical Synod, or Eighth Ecumenical Council. Mm -hmm. I understand the actual text, when it's finalized, will be longer than this because of all the notes and everything. Yes, yes. This is uh, just the Acts, and then we're going to be publishing notes, introduction by a contemporary scholar 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and the n notes and introduction by uh, Dositheus of Jerusalem. So this is going to be another 100, 150 pages. Fantastic. I told Father <clears throat> Peter that this is a book that I've been waiting probably about 15 years to be published. I've been hoping that somebody would publish these acts. But right off the bat, someone's going to look at this and say, but Father, I've, I've been told in what seem like official catechisms, there are only seven ecumenical councils. Yes, this is what so so what, what, is, what is this thing about an eighth ecumenical council? You know, it's so important. That's why we did this conference down in Alabama, and we translating the Acts, and we're spending so much time on it. And it's extremely important for us, even if you, I mean, don't get hung up on the number or you're hung up on the official number. Look at the history. Look at the theology. Look at how important it is. You can't understand the Great Schism if you don't understand what happened at and after the Eighth Ecumenical Council. But to get to the question, is there an Eighth Ecumenical Council? Absolutely, the Orthodox Church never doubted it, and we have a number of historical events that happened from that time to the day which confirms that the Church always accepted it. If you go, for instance, to the encyclical of the, uh, of the patriarchs to reply to the Pope in 1848, which was all the, the uh, four patriarchs, and in that letter that they sent, it says, it commemorates this as the Eighth Ecumenical Council under Photius. Uh, we have saints that have commemorated as such. We have the the council that overturned Florence commemorated and referred to it as the Eighth Ecumenical Council. We have canonists throughout the uh, early, uh, let's see, 300 years of the second millennium who commemorated it as the Eighth Ecumenical Council. So the question is really not, is it the Eighth Ecumenical Council? Do we commemorate it? But how did we lose consciousness of it and why? When did, it, when did we stop talking about it as the Eighth Ecumenical Council? Uh, that is the question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> so I mean, so we, we have the eighth, and <clears throat> many would also argue a ninth, correct? With yes, the three councils, yes. so the, the Palamite councils. Yes, and again, people are going to get caught up on technicalities. Well, you know, when and how was it ratified by the sec next ecumenical council? That's a little bit of a fallacy. Uh, the church does that, absolutely, and confirms it, but it confirms it in other ways, too. It confirms it, first and foremost, most essentially, by accepting the teaching and making it its own. And then when St. Gregory Paul Lamas is commemorated in this and, and put as the commemoration of the second week of Great Lent as a continuation of the, of the Sunday of Orthodoxy, it's obvious that the church has embraced his theology, that they glorified him in 10 years, which was unprecedented, is an example mm -hmm. that they, they accepted his theology. That the, and, and then if you want something more technical, look at the fact that it was an emperor, and so one of the reasons why we call it an ecumenical council, and it's not just a council, is because of the whole empire, the emperor, and all the empire was uh, ratified it and accepted it. So it has all of that. So if the proclamation of the council is universally accepted just as much as the seven councils before it, is this really just a question of semantics, whether we, whether we term it ecumenical or not? But uh, on, a, on a level of, I don't know if we want to use the word authority, but as, as far as the, the, uh, the, the proclamation being official for the church, it shares everything in common with the seven ecumenical councils. Yeah, and I would say that there's a couple of things we should just point out immediately, which will point to the fact that it's not only essentially accepted, but it's officially accepted. Mm -hmm. First of all, the seventh ecumenical council was ratified by which council? And why do we consider it ecumenical? Right. The eighth. The eighth. Eighth. So if you don't accept, I mean, it's a little bit of a circular reason. If you don't accept, why do you accept the seventh? On what, on what basis? Well, because the eighth ratified it. So besides that, we have historical uh, confirmation in the West. Up until and after the schism, they were still recognizing as the eighth ecumenical council. So this is, this is the, what I really want to talk about. Before we talk about that, though, one last question about the, the acceptance of this council. Are there saints who have recognized it and named it as the eighth ecumenical council? Sure, sure. We have that. Uh, right now, I mean, I have to go to this book and, and remind my, be reminded by which saints commemorated it. I think St. Mark of Ephesus commemorates it, but I, 
we have a section in this. Uh, this is another book we published recently, The Divine Service of the Eighth Ecumenical Council, written uh, recently. The service was written recently and commemorated uh, and used in the Church of Greece in the diocese, in several dioceses under Metropolitan Seraphim Peros and also Metropolitan Herothos Vlakos and others. And they're celebrating the feast. And so, and then we have a section in here, try, trying to remind myself, where the St. Nectarios, for instance, commemorates. Which it is the Atheic Council. I think is one of the most significant ones. Yes. It's been so recent. It yes. It in 1920. St. Nectarios is one of the ones. So this is the one, the St. Nectarios is commemorated in this uh, book with other contemporary scholars. So this, this obviously goes to the question of uh, Orthodox and Roman relations. And th there's kind of an interesting thing. As I understood it, and I could be wrong about this, uh, as I understood it, um, part of the papal teachings, ex cathedra, as they say, the infallible teachings, part of the, the authority of the Pope is in approving ecumenical councils in, in the West. The, the Roman Catholics believe that for an ecumenical council, to officially be an ecumenical council, it must be approved by the Pope of Rome. And, and I, I, it would be my guess that this would be among the, the acts of, of the, the Pope uh, uh, working ex cathedra in its official capacity as the Pope. I'm guessing. There'd probably be a debate around that, but you would think that is, is there anything more official for a Pope to do than to accept the council or not, right? Make it the That's, accepted faith. It right? seems as official yeah, as you yeah. get. <laughs> like, so, I mean, what else? Was there something else besides that? Then? So, so, as I understand it, with the Eighth Ecumenical Council, there was a much smaller council that happened beforehand, that was that was then condemned by this council. Yes. And uh, eight sixty nine. Are, are you are you suggesting that the the Pope at that time actually accepted this as yes. as an ecumenical council? John the Eighth. John the Eighth was his name, and he accepted it. In fact, there's some speculation because he was murdered afterwards, and it's very interesting. There's some speculation. Why was he murdered? Hmm. The person who took his place denied it was against the council. But he accepted it. And then the person who came after him, eventually it was accepted in the West, but there was back and forth. So the previous Pope to him, who was supportive, was against Photios, Nicholas. Uh, I don't know, remember if it was Nicholas, I don't know if there's a Nicholas the Sixth or Fourth, I can't remember the name, but it's Nick, Pope Nicholas. He was the one that was basically condemned by the, or not condemned per se, but his stance was condemned at the Eighth Ecumenical Council. He was the Pope during the uh, so-called Eighth Ecumenical Council uh, which for the West afterwards. So like 200 years later, they changed. And they went back to recognizing the previous council, which was condemned by the Eighth Ecumenical Council. And they said, oh, that's the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Um, but they had for 150 years accepted the Council of Photios as the Eighth Ecumenical Council. They, they went along. For how many years? About 150. 150 years. Yeah. So what, what are the main... Uh, I don't like using the word decisions with the Ecumenical Council, but what are the main proclamations of the Eighth Ecumenical Council? So they were dealing with uh, practical and theological matters, and at the heart of it was what was going on in Bulgaria at the time. So the Bulgarian uh, people were being missionized and by missionaries sent by St. Photius, but also they were Western missionaries coming down from the Franks. They brought with them the Filioque, and they wanted to impose that and make everybody to accept the, the Filioque. Uh, and in a very heavy-handed way. And of course, the church in Constantinople reacted very strongly against that and wrote, um, wrote against that. And so this council was basically a reunion council because they had condemned Photius 10 years earlier. Photius was reinstated. And then this council was called. And they came in a, in, 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 you can tell in the Acts, they came in a way to say like, okay, we're in charge here and we're going to, we're going to make everything better again. But the, nobody, in the Acts, you can tell nobody's buying into it. The, the East, all the other bishops from the East are like, yeah, whatever, whatever, you know, okay. But so they end up accepting the, the council's acts and in there condemns anyone who would add or subtract to the creed. And obviously at that time, what was going on? The Filioque, they were, they were, they were trying to impose it on the, in the, in the new, newly illumined Bulgarians. So it's obvious that they're talking about the Filioque. What else, what else was being added or subtracted to the creed? And Rome was orthodox at the time. They did not want to add to the creed. They were against it. They went along with the decisions because they had no problem. But, the, but there were forces in Northern Europe that wanted to, for the sake of, of political, mainly political reasons, they wanted to impose the filioque uh, to differentiate themselves from, from, from uh, uh, Roman orthodoxy in Constantinople. Uh, so, so in principle, they condemned anyone who would add to the creed. And then in 1009 and then 1014, Rome fell to the, to the desires of the Franks and they added to the creed. That's essentially the beginning of the Great Schism. 
the, the Pope was taken out of the, the uh, diptychs at that time in, in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. And then for three decades, the situation went on of basically no, no interaction, no communion, no concelebration between Constantinople and Rome. And then they had the anathemas in 1054. So it's, it's a grave uh, disservice to any Orthodox theologian or teacher that, that says that, you know, we didn't really know why, uh, when the schism starts. This is like, they kind of get this gray area around this. No, it was, it was very clear that they walked away from the Eighth Ecumenical Council and the Creed by adding to the field inquiry. And it was immediate mm -hmm. the reaction on the East. There was no doubt of what, what were they doing? They were walking away from the Council and the faith of the Council. So that's... That's essential. But it's so strange that they went, they didn't really officially change it as recognizing it as the Ethiopian Council for, it's, I'm not sure exactly how long, but it was definitely decades later right. that they came back and said, oh, well, oh, wait a minute, we've got to change that and we've got to recognize 869 because that's... It that, didn't look too good for them. It didn't look too good. <laughs> yeah. did, did the council also address the, the uh, authority of, uh, of the, the Patriarch of Rome, of the Pope? Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about his authority and they, and they pushed back against it very forcefully in the council. Um, they didn't have a, I don't think it's a part of the acts, but it's a part of, I mean, the decisions of the council, the official like uh, proclamations, uh, but it's throughout the acts. This is why it's so fascinating. You've got to read the acts of the council. And by the way, there's a, there's a good discussion going on. I don't, you know, I don't know, I'm not that up on it, but this will help people to understand better in practice. You know, the, the, there's some people who approach the ecumenical councils in a very, I think, limited and kind of legalistic way only the you know they want to like minimize the the authority of the council to a certain degree and only the written decisions and canons but in fact the whole all of the council needs to be taken in context and all of the the decisions and the and the discussion needs to be seen in context to really understand the 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 import and the meaning. It's much like reading the life of the saint or studying a saint. You want to read their life first and know what the yes. what they were writing about, what what caused the, the the necessity for these writings. It's the same with the ecumenical synods. Yes, and you yes. get a real sense of the ethos of the church when you read these things. Correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, nuances. A lot of nuances come out. So I, I learned something today. I actually did not know this about about the cease of the commemoration. I was just asked about this recently about uh, when the Great Schism occurred, and I gave that I gave you know it, it had been occurring for hundreds of years. It continued to occur until uh, uh, typically the Fourth Crusade is what people what people state. So I've I've learned something. So on one level, that's true, but it's not accurate. It's not a complete picture. There was certainly on a on a more social level, political level, there was you know attempts to uh, unification mm -hmm. and all the rest. But the idea that the Orthodox in the East didn't know why they ceased. Um, they ceased to commemorate him, or that, that this was just simply cultural and linguistic. No, no, which, yeah, which is yeah. it's, it's that's why odd. again it's so essential we understand this council and the and the decisions of the council because then we can understand what happened in ten fourteen and and uh, and, this, and you know the, ad, the addition of the filioque. So two two more questions. The the first regarding this, it's it's often stated by contemporary theologians that. In the West, with the filioque, they never pushed the idea that the Father and the Son were both causes of the Holy Spirit. That they they've always pushed the idea that Saint Maximus said uh, that the Father was the cause, but the Holy Spirit proceeds through the Son. But they do have official records that state the Son as a cause. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yes, and that was what they were writing against, both Saint Photios and Saint Gregory Palamas. So the idea that they're writing against some kind of you know ghost or some kind of misunderstanding is a little bit hard to swallow. We were. They were, they were writing against what was f circulating and, and being proposed, and for a long time. I mean, Palamas comes 300 years later uh, or more. And so um, the dub double cause was definitely what was uh, we've been proposed in the West and defended. I want to say one thing that I forgot in our con conference that came out, which is really important. There's this idea going around as well that in the West, um, the filioque was pretty much a given, except Rome. Rome was the last bastion and everything else around it. it was, Rome was an island of non-filioque. And the East knew that, and we lived with it. And we kind of tolerated the filioque for hundreds of years. This is something I've heard and seen uh, stated online. We had a, a speaker, Father Filothios, from Petrovoda Monastery in Romania, who, who presented at our conference. We just put this on, online. If you're, so if people are interested, they can go and watch this. He gave a talk in which he shows manuscripts uh, from the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th century, even after the schism in the West, major uh, centers uh, where they were, you know, they were producing the creed in the, in the various liturgical books and everything with no filioque. 
hmm. and writing against the filioque in Paris and other places. So he gives the picture that, in fact, uh, it wasn't just in Rome, but there were people fighting against filioque in a variety of places in Italy and France, uh, uh, even up until the schism and even after the schism in the hmm. West, which is much more reasonable, right? I mean, in England and other places, they were not, not everybody was just blindly uh, following the, the Franks. The, it, was a, it, was, it was a process of political um, you know, power inserting and enforcing and imposing the filioque on the Western church. So this is, this is an area that there still needs to be more research, more academic work done to uh, uncover some of this. To uncover that. He's done a good, good start, mm -hmm. Father Filotios, yeah. So you brought with you some other uh, some other books. Uh, your your press, Uncut Mountain Press, has been uh, very busy very lately. Busy. The past few years, have, we've seen the publication, the republication of works that I, I know I've I've been really hoping for. Yes, the Truth God. of Our Faith by Elder Cleopa is one that I was so glad was republished. Thank God. So you brought some other things to share. So what? Yeah, did, what did yeah you I encourage people to go to UncutMountainPress.com for all the books because we've got about I don't even know how many we have now, thirty books or something. But so there, and there's going to be a ton more coming out in the next six to eight months. Um, really important works. Let me say that first, and then we'll get to the ones in front of me. I want you to get people to be uh, keep in, have in mind that we're going to be coming out with a huge tome about as big as this one, uh, or la larger actually, it's called The Errors of the Latins. Mm -hmm. And it's a collection of contradictions, errors, forgeries, manipulations in the West from before the schism all the way until today, showing the, the discontinuity of, of, of theology in the West. I had a parishioner who wanted to write this book. Yeah. Never got around to it, so I'm glad you are. <laughs> yes, yes. So this will be really good for researchers and also anybody who's interested. From He's a Roman Catholic and he's troubled and he's searching. This will be an amazing volume for all of them. And so it's, it's been a, about an eight-year project or seven-year project on the oh. part of the author. That's coming out in about three months. Also coming out uh, in the fall are a number of books by the Colivadis Fathers and on the Colivadis Fathers. Wonderful. St. Pardio, St. Athanasius Pardos on philosophy and enlightenment. Uh, we've got um, a book by Father Theodore Zisis called Colivadica, it's called in Greek, and it's analysis of a variety of issues around the Colivadis Fathers. That's another book that I've been hoping to come uh, out. Then we've got um, St. Hilary and Trotsky's second volume of his, of his collected works. It's oh, really? coming out in the fall. That's done. Uh, we've got, uh, in the works, we've got a book all about St. Isaac the Syrian and whether the new revelations about him are true and accurate. We're going to be showing the, the English-speaking world a very good book about how they've misunderstood St. Isaac. and He's not a, neither an historian nor is he a universalist. Mm -hmm. So in defense of, uh, of St. Isaac is, is the name. The book is something like the, 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 uh, the, the mistreated or unjustly treated saint is the name of the book. Um, we've got we've got a number of my writings and talks coming out as well. We've got um, I can't we've got well because the the axe will be out in about a month. Anyway, a lot of things coming out. You can go check it out in North uh, Uncle Mountain Press forthcoming titles. Right here in front of us, we've got as, as we said earlier the Divine Service, which is phenomenal, and and the articles by Metropolitan Herothios and Metropolitan Seraphim about the Eighth Ecumenical, defending Wonderful. it. Uh, we've got a really a massive tome, uh, Catholicism, the Orthodox Patristic Witness Concerning Catholicism. This is a work in, that took about six years and a lot of research time, and we're really indebted to uh, the researchers who put so much time and effort to bring this about. But essentially, it's the Synaxarium of all the saints who have anything to do with Catholicism. It's the writings of the saints. Uh, the major writings, excerpts from them, it's conciliar decisions and historical events and also uh, contemporary theologians. So it's, it's just a total spherical examination of what does the orthodox authorities, which are the saints, think about and understand the Catholicism to be. Instead of what does this particular theologian today or hierarch say, because he may or may not be following the Holy Fathers. We want the people of God to know these are the authorities. Or this conciliar statement. That, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. All right. And then we've got a new book just put out uh, all about homeschooling and schools, Orthodox schools called Formation and the Love of Truth by myself. And it's uh, all about uh, the imperative for Orthodox education and homeschooling and schools and the, the uh, whole uh, history of compulsory education and how mm -hmm. important it is that we as Orthodox do not um, be led astray in how we're going to raise and educate our children. So 
I think that's the only book on the on your the table display here that I haven't picked up yet. So I'll get one today. <laughs> <laughs> and then we just came out with the first of many pamphlets, uh, which I think is going to be beloved in, in, over time. Um, very you know short reads, pamphlets like you've seen before, but on topics maybe have not been covered. So first one is by Dr. Constantine Cavarnos, The Church in the Home, which is a very beautiful little book about what do we need to do to make our home a church or, or, or church atmosphere. And then we have a book called Born of the Water and the Spirit about the reception into the church, uh, the patristic teaching on how to be received into the church. This is Helmet of Salvation, Which is wonderful. A, a wonderful homily by Bishop Alexi of Alaska about the head covering, really uh, spiritual examination. Uh, and we have a book from, these two booklets are from the Monastery of the Paraclete outside of Athens, a really, really wonderful monastery. It's produced tons of material over the years. These are the first two that we've, public, we've translated. First one is called, Should We Be Set Apart From Others? Mm -hmm. so this is about the stance of the Christian in regard to the community, the social life, the world, a uh, very good patristic text. And the final one is there, well known in Greek. It's probably tens of thousands of copies of it. It's all about what is ecumenism from the Orthodox patristic view. So these, these are now available for parishes and people uh, through our website. And Fantastic. there's many more books, but that's the, the latest. Final question. Yeah. Very, very common for me to get a Roman Catholic who is dissatisfied with contemporary Roman Catholicism come into the parish and find theological works like this, but also defenses of papalism and Roman Catholicism on the other side, and they get very confused with the theological back and forth, and they don't know what to do. What advice do you have for someone in that situation? So, you know, the, the typical approach to orthodoxy in the West is with the head only, and it's, uh, it's got to be, you know, we've got to think, we've got to figure it all out. Uh, and we and we think that um, you know who's going to be proved right historically. We're going to examine the Council of Florence. Well, who's right on the Council of Florence? Well, that must mean that this church is right. Uh, but this is a very narrow and um, uh, and um, an incomplete examination and approach. There's so much, so much more, so much more. First of all, there's the experience of God. There's the uh, the, the spiritual life. There's the authenticity. There's the dogma and the ethos, which are inseparable. If you're only going to look at the dogma, you ha you're only getting half of the story about what is, where, where is truth, where is the church, where is Christ. Mm -hmm. Look at the ethos. And the ethos is not just the moral life, it's the whole way of Christ. Mm -hmm. I think this is the biggest difference between the Orthodox and the West, is the way of Orthodoxy, the daily, and the, the ethos, the, the outlook on how to live, all these things, there's just a chasm between the East and the West in this. So you've got, to, you've got to have a spherical look at orthodoxy. And most importantly, you've got to come and see and experience the, the Spirit of God. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have a aliosi, we say in Greek. In other words, a, a, a like internal transformation. You, know, a, 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 you have to have uh, come with pain of heart. Mm -hmm. You have to come with compunction and contrition. And, and it, it, you know, seeking the truth, not in terms of an intellectual analysis where you're sit, you're in charge and you're if you're the you know you've got it under the microscope you're never going to find the truth like that it's the truth is incarnate it, throughout history it's the the church is the continuation of incarnation and we want to find christ now the who is the same yesterday today and forever experientially not just intellectually not just you know who's who's right but who where we find the person of christ and the image of christ as he has always been and always will be. And I think that the, you know, the pristine image of Christ is preserved in the lives of the saints in the Orthodox Church. So, so my typical advice to people, I, one of the reasons I love Father Peter is because he calls me out when I'm wrong, and I need that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but I, my, I, I need that too. One of my, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> one of my typical pieces of advice, it sounds like it's in line with what you're saying, is I tell them, read three ancient lives. You know, typically, like, uh, St. Martin of Tours' life is great. Yes. Uh, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Anthony the Great. Yes. Pick another one. And then find three modern Orthodox lives and three modern Catholic saints' lives and compare and see which one great looks idea. and feels yeah. like the ancient ones. Yeah. And typically if yeah. they read uh, St. Paisios, um, both, yes. both English biographies are, yes. are fantastic. Yes. Um, and there, there are so many. I mean, you, you list them on forever. But yes. is that a fair approach? I think it's a great approach. And I, talk, I say the same thing. If you want to follow the Holy Fathers of the ancient days, you've got to follow the saints of today. You cannot follow the ancient fathers or even the fathers from 200 years ago today if you don't follow the saints today. Because that's how tradition works. 
That's how we receive Christ. He's, and that's how you are in the, the, the diachronic river of tradition that's coming mm -hmm. down to us today. If you jump back, here, what happens? You're analyzing them on your own grounds. You're not following and obedient and, and submitting yourself. I mean, Protestants who never have any interest in becoming Orthodox, they can sit and pour over Chrysostom or St. Ignatius. And it doesn't mean that they understand and live the life that they're talking about. Because they're coming out, they're analyzing it in a way that's not going to bring them under and submit themselves to the living tradition. Like when the apostles said, we saw him, we touched him, we, right? we spoke to him, we saw him. That's the experience we're looking for. And that happens in time and space right now, today. Where are the saints today? And when I wrote the introduction, we translated the life of St. Paisios, I wrote in the introduction that we don't have a ref, uh, you know, reformation, a continuous reformation. like in, We don't have the need to go back to anything. It's all you know, this aggiornamento and all these, this way of both Protestant and Catholicism is that we gotta find something we lost, we gotta renew something that's, that's de dead, we've gotta rediscover something. None of that is going on in Orthodoxy. Right now, read St. Paisius, it's the Acts of the Apostles today. It's the same life and power and uh, miracles and, and heavenly visitations that you see throughout the whole history of the and, church. And Christ himself and many saints appeared to St. Paisios, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, St. Uh, St. Justin Popovich had a conversation with St. Paul. Yes. So, yes. so that's, that's where you start. You start with today's saints. Today's, and this is true, by the way, for Orthodox people, mm. because you can get led astray today, even in the Orthodox Church, by various sectarian or ecumenistic rivers coming down that don't go back and do not bring you into contact with the diachronic tradition. So it's true across the board. You've got, you've got to hone in on where are the apostles today? Where are the saints today? Who are, who's the, speaking the voice of God? So will, will the, the uh, Uncut Mountain Press be publishing any lives of modern saints or elders? Yes, we're working right now on Elder Justin Pervio. We just got the Romanian text that we've been waiting for, and we're beginning the translation work. Wonderful. He's one of the great elders of our day. Well, those who, who watch my channel know uh, I'm married to a Romanian, so I have a special affinity for the, uh, the Romanian elders so do and we. saints. So do we. We love them. them. We were just in Romania a few months ago. Ah, uh, I'm jealous. <laughs> jealous. Moldavia is amazing. We went to Nyams. We saw the St. Paisios. St. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the unknown saint next to him. You know, he's probably, I don't know what the, who the unknown saint is, but, you know, they dug up the, the relics in, in, the, in the pathway, right? Right, right. I think that's St. Paisius. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It just makes sense to me, but they don't know. I guess they don't know officially who it is. I'll do a video on that at some point with yeah, some pictures. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I don't know. I don't know either. I'm just say, saying it's very, very curious. Did you get a chance to, to go uh, near Bucharest to um, uh, Curte de Argeș? No, we didn't actually. We only had a few days. I will only tell you, and again, I'll do a video on this at some point about the saint that we named my first daughter for, St. Philothea, the protector of Romania. Never in my life have I been at relics and experienced such grace wow. as being in front of the relics of a 14-year-old girl. Wow. It, I, I've never experienced it. I, I told my wife, you could have locked me in that, in that chapel for a month with no food and no water. I, I would have been fine. <laughs> I, you, I, it, just, it, yeah. it was so powerful. Anyway, I will end the video by asking forgiveness of Father P I told him, I told him 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, and it's been a half hour. But, it goes by fast. But I appreciate it so much. Thank and there's you. so many things I'd like to ask you, but Lord maybe for God. another time. So Lord God. Thank in, you, the, uh, in the words of the great uh, Romanian elder, Cleopas of Siastria, may heaven consume you. Amen.